we're live. Good morning, everyone. And uh, to those who have joined us uh, live via Zoom this morning, and to those who will be <clears throat> watching the recording um, later on on our YouTube channel, we're so pleased you've uh, joined us for worship this morning. Our service this morning has been provided by the Regional Council 15, and uh, it was prepared, uh, as the screen says, by the Faith Formation and Leadership Development Committee. So I uh, hope you enjoy the pictures of lighthouses from around Region 15, which includes Nova Scotia and Bermuda. <clears throat> so welcome to this, uh, to this church service. Um, the service, as I said, has been prepared by Regional Council 15, and hopefully it will be a, a project that continues in future years to provide communities of faith within the region with services of worship that can be used in the ministry uh, when our when the regional personnel but when ministry personnel are away uh, for annual meetings <clears throat> the service is modeled on the uh, opening worship of regional council of meeting 15 meetings and the theme this year was beacons of hope and so how how we are called to be beacons of hope uh, in our in our church and in our world uh, today <clears throat> So I want to begin this morning, I'm going to take my earphones off and move over to uh, light the candles in a moment. But uh, with this morning, our, I think our acknowledgement of, of place um, has a, a poignant and, um, you know, a heartfelt, uh, we hope, uh, meaning this morning as we <clears throat> heard this news, the, the tragic news this week uh, from British Columbia, the discovery of 218 uh, Indigenous persons, uh, mostly children who had been uh, unknowingly buried on the on the grounds of a residential school, um, and so we can only imagine the the pain and 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 the loss of the communities and uh, and families uh, from from that uh, terrible time in our in our nation's history, and so uh, it is with great uh, respect that we gather in this place with grat and remember with gratitude that we live and worship on lands that are by law the unceded territory of the Wabanaki peoples, predominantly the lands of the Mi'kmaq, the Maliseet, and the Passamaquoddy. And we acknowledge the Mi'kmaq people and their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. Coal Harbor Woodside United Church is a safe place for all people to worship, regardless of gender identity, race, creed, age, ability, cultural background or sexual orientation. Before we move to the call to worship, I'll light our candles this morning. Christ candle reminds us of Christ and Christ's light in our lives and in the world. And the smaller candle reminds us of uh, the work that we have to do uh, in honor and in remembrance of those uh, all indigenous persons who, uh, who were abused and who died at the hands of, uh, in, at the hands of those who were running <clears throat> residential schools, uh, put together as programmed by our governments, and even participated in by us in the United Church. And so we gather, we honor, and we remember. So let us participate in our call to worship. <clears throat> in you, O oh God, we take mm. refuge. As we think of those around us, both physically and virtually, help us to find space to be grounded as we worship you together. Let us have compassion to those who those suffering and be the strength and guiding light to all who reach out. We come expectant of a sign, a beacon of hope. Come, let us worship. Thank you. 
And so yesterday, I, <clears throat> or the day before, I had a chance to record a, a, a time for our children. So uh, all of us who are young and young at heart, I hope you will uh, gain something from uh, this this morning. Okay, how about I just tell you what's happening in the video because we're having trouble with the sound this morning. <laughs> so the idea is that <clears throat> we, uh, uh, we, we love chocolate chip muffins, right? I, I love chocolate chip muffins. Anyone else love chocolate chip muffins or muffins of any kind, cake or any of those sorts of things? Well, I do too. <clears throat> so uh, one of the things though we realize is when we think about all the things that go into chocolate, you know, chocolate chip muffins, for instance. Uh, so you've got some- Try this again, Mike. Oh, we're gonna try it again. Okay, good. I can explain it, but there we go. Can you hear that now? Share the children's time with you this morning. Uh, so this morning I want to talk with the kids about um, the different parts that go into the whole of something. So. I have here today some beautiful muffins that were made by Tamara uh, for our son Joshua. And they look great. You'd eat those with no problem, wouldn't you? Yeah, I know I would. I love chocolate chip muffins. But I wanted to think about all the things that went in to those muffins. So, and I have them all assembled here this afternoon. So you need some to start with some basic things. So flour. Now, if you took a bag of flour and wanted to eat that, that would be pretty terrible, wouldn't it? You wouldn't eat flour all on itself. That, would be, that wouldn't be so good. Uh, muffins also need some baking powder. And you wouldn't eat that by itself either. That would be really, really awful to eat. Ugh. Now you might eat a little bit of sugar because it takes sugar you know, to, to, to make muffins. So you might eat a little bit of that. You may even need a little bit of butter or but probably not salt that would be gross if you ate salt joshua's also lactose intolerant so we give him soy milk you could drink that that'd be pretty good and some people even eat eggs raw i never have but some people like them but i certainly like them cooked and then finally the last thing that goes into these muffins is of course chocolate chips and I could eat a whole bunch of those all by themselves without having them in a muffin. But the point is, all of these different things, they go together to make these wonderful, delicious muffins. And it's really interesting because that's the way we are as the church as well, isn't it? We're all different. God makes us with all of our own gifts and our own talents. God gives us uh, the ability to speak or uh, maybe the ability to sing or to read, or to be happy and to greet people, um, or just to be there when somebody needs it. God gives us all of those things. Can you imagine, though, if the whole church was only singers? It might be fun for a while. Or if maybe the whole uh, church were ministers preaching all the time. Mm, probably not so fun. 
We need a wonderful variety of things to make Cole Harper Woodside United Church the wonderful church that it is. And sometimes those things don't seem so good on their own, like salt or flour or baking soda or baking powder. But when we take all of the gifts that we have in Cole Harper Woodside United Church and we put them all together, we make something that's wonderful. We make a wonderful church family that loves and serves God, that works together in the community, and tries to do uh, what God calls us to do throughout the course of our daily lives. So the next time you go to grab a delicious muffin like that, think about all the things that went into it, and think about your church. And when we all get a chance to get back together, think of all of the wonderful things that each one of us bring to make Cole Harbor Woodside United Church the awesome place it is. It's good to be with you. Take care. And now I invite us to share in the words of the repeat after me prayer. <clears throat> Dear God, thank you for good times. Thank you for hard times. Thank you for using all time to create this beautiful life. Thank you for the hope that you are always with us. Amen. We're going to sing again, just the chorus this time. You're muted, Mike. Thought I had clicked that. Thanks, Ron. <laughs> so, so what I was saying was uh, what we did yesterday afternoon as we concluded our business as Regional Council 15 was we entered into a time of covenant. Uh, and in the church, we're familiar with covenants. We, we know of the covenants that God made with the people of Israel and the covenant that we have uh, in, in the life, death, and the experience of Jesus' resurrection. Uh, as God's people, <clears throat> but we also covenant with one another. Uh, baptisms are covenants. Marriages are covenants. When I came to Cole Harbor Woodside United Church as ministry personnel, uh, we covenanted together to work together uh, as people, as God's people in this time and in this place. And so this was an opportunity for us, <clears throat> and is an opportunity for us this morning, uh, to think about the ways that we are covenanted together, not only as a community of faith. Cold Harbor Woodside, uh, but also with Regional Council 15 and with the whole of the United Church of Canada. And so in the unison times, I invite you to share uh, in the words that you'll see on your screen. Uh, they'll be in bold. <clears throat> Christ's body is composed of many parts. Christ has many ministries. Some are easy, others are difficult. Some bring honor, others bring reproach. Some are suitable to our natural inclinations and our temporal interests, and others are contrary to both. Yet the power to do all these things is given to us in Christ, who strengthens us. We, the people of Cole Harbor Woodside Pastoral Church, renew our covenant of mutual responsibility with Region 15 of the United Church of Canada. We will seek after God in all we say and think and do and live in communion with God and each other. We will search for what God wants through prayer in scripture and by fellowshipping with each other as we listen to God through any media. We will celebrate God's presence in worship, 
music, life passages, and sacraments. We will invite others to join us in our journey with God. We will do all things for the glory of God and the good of God's world. We will give ourselves to God and rededicate ourselves to live in covenant as the people of God and the living body of Christ. To God be all glory, praise, honor, and thanksgiving now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> Thanks to Ron for uh, providing the, the voice of all uh, this morning. So our first uh, reading this morning comes from the book of Lamentations. It's not a book that we uh, turn to often, but it's one that does have passages for, uh, uh, for us that are, that are familiar. Uh, so the author writes, <clears throat> the thought of my affliction and my homelessness is wormwood and gall. My soul continually thinks of it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. And our next reading uh, comes uh, to us from the Gospel of Matthew. <clears throat> At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me. All you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. May we in the church hear what the Spirit speaks to us through these words of our scriptures this day and always. So this is a story I'll share with you that was provided by the region. It's, it's a, a, an allegory or a legend, um, but it reminds us of how important um, we are as the church in society. And I know that uh, for a lot of us, we feel that um, uh, perhaps as a church, we don't have any influence or we don't have any uh, 
you know, any place in the wider society that uh, perhaps maybe our, uh, our place has diminished and we're not able to, uh, to bring to bear uh, any sort of influence or, or whatever in our society. But I want you to think about the ways in which Cole Harbor Woodside United Church is a beacon of hope for those not only uh, in our community, but because we participate in the work of Regional Council 15 and the United Church of Canada as a whole, we truly are a beacon of hope for people all around the world. Um, yesterday, during our Regional Council meeting, we got to hear a report to, from uh, the Mission and Service Fund. And there were, there were people from all over the world, Canada included, um, who talked about how important the work of the Mission and Service Fund is uh, for uh, people all around all around the world, uh, the ways in which we as a church uh, are helping them in their lives in very real ways. So I'll share this story with you this morning. So the story is told of an ancient culture that had itself high atop, atop a rocky plateau, kind of like the Sambro lighthouse that's there in the picture. It was surrounded by deep sides and cliffs. There was no path leading up or down, yet in spite of their uh, isolation, the people had what they needed. Rich soil grew abundant crops, rich lakes provided fish and forests provided wood and animals, and deep wells were fed with springs of uh, fresh water that were plentiful. Now, as long as anyone could remember, the entire purpose of their culture had been to keep the beacon light burning. And they took pride in ensuring that it never went out. In all of their history, there had never been a time where the beacon had not shone from the top of the plateau. People had always known of their work and how important it was. And people came all over to the foot of the cliff, to look up and to celebrate the light that was on the cliff. But as time changed and people changed, as they always do, fewer and fewer people came to give their thanks for the light of the beacon. And those who did come didn't bring the joy that they had in times gone past. There was less celebrating and more obligation. And after a while, fewer and fewer came. And the people who looked after the light began to feel unappreciated and neglected and discouraged. And they began to wonder if maybe they should just let the beacon go out. So as they discovered and uh, discussed and, and talked amongst themselves, it was decided that they would send out messengers to go out into the world and find out if people really needed the beacon any longer. So the first person traveled south into dense forests. And the farther they traveled away from the beacon, the, the more and more they found themselves surrounded by trees on all sides, lush vegetation and thick undergrowth. Surely in this place, the beacon couldn't be seen. It didn't matter. And as night fell, the messenger wondered if they should simply turn back with the sad news that nobody seemed to care, that the beacon didn't matter. But just when they were debating, they heard a faint whimper and realized it was a child. They found the child and they were cold and frightened and all alone and took an ember that, he had, that they had carried from the beacon and lit a fire to warm the child. And as they sat by the fire, they found comfort in one another. They heard a noise and it was a group of hunters approaching. And when they saw the child, they were so happy. They'd been searching and hadn't been able to find the child because it had become lost in the dense forest. And the messenger surprised. The people seemed unperturbed. They sent a, a messenger of, of their own up to the top of the most tall tree to find a way back to their village. And they asked, the messenger asked, how will you find your way there? The forest is so thick, you'll never see your way back to your village. And the people from the village replied, oh, but from the top of the tree, we can see the light of the beacon from far, far away, and we will know how to get home. And so they did. They waited the night and in the morning, they were headed off in the direction to go home. And the messenger smiled and went back to his village. Now the second one headed across rich farmlands and open prairies. They traveled for many hours and saw nobody. 
And as darkness approached, they decided to stop. And they took out the, be the ember that they carried from the beacon and slowly coaxed it into light and fire. And a voice came from the darkness. What are you doing here all alone? The messenger answered, I was just stopping here to prepare a meal. Would you like to join me? Don't mind if I do, said the stranger. It's been a long time since I sat around a campfire and shared a meal. Would it be okay if I called a few of my friends to join us? It's been so long for them as well. I know they would love to see and talk and get to know one another. Of course, the messenger said. It was amazing how quickly things changed. The tiny sparks, sparks soon became a fire. Their camp chairs with food and drink. The prairie so soon rang with song and laughter. As people had been too busy with their concerns and worries, set them aside and came together. As the fire died down and the crowd began to disperse, the messenger said, why don't each of you take a few of these embers with you to remind yourselves of how important it is to share your time, your struggles with each other. And at last, when the last one departed, those who had been strangers were now friends. And the messenger returned, began the journey home to the beacon. The third messenger headed to the north, he joined the crew of a ship heading out to the great sea. The shores lapped at the base of the cliff. They hadn't been traveling long when a storm blew up and the ship began to heave and it soon felt to the messenger that they were being tossed around like a toy in a tub. Having never experienced the water, the messenger was terrified, but the majority of the crew seemed unfocused, unfazed, and focused on the work that they needed to do, unaware of the waves. And the messenger asked one, how can you be so calm in the midst of this storm? And the crew person said, well, see the beacon up on the cliff? As long as we can keep that beacon in our sights, we know exactly where we are, how far we are from shore, and which way we need to head. Sure, the waves can be frightening, but if we trust the beacon, we'll find our way home. And so the winds began to die down. The ship moored. The messenger realized with a huge sigh of gratitude just how important the beacon was. <clears throat> Excuse me. The last messenger headed to the east towards large cities and busy streets. And they marveled at the towering offices and the busy shops. Such richness and prosperity was almost beyond their imagining. They had a job to do. They tried to talk to people who were hurrying along the way, but no one seemed to want to stop and talk. And as the day went by, they became more and more distressed and they felt, how could I return home to tell, that, tell the people that the beacon didn't even exist in this place? <clears throat> and so with a heavy heart, they turned back along the streets without knowing if they would find anyone to talk to. And they approached the corner and there was someone huddled in an alley under a tattered blanket. And they looked up and said, do you have anything to eat? The messenger was heartbroken. I, I don't have anything, I'm, I'm so sorry, but maybe I can help you stay warm. And searching around, they found a few sticks and discarded boards from broken wooden boxes. And for some time, they managed to get a small fire started. And the man drew closer to the fire and stopped shivering. Thank you, they said with a smile. There are so many of us living here on the streets that are, that are cold and, and hungry, and most people just ignore us. Your kindness has made a difference to me. Gently, the messenger bent down, took the person's hand and said, keep the ember and you share it with anyone who needs it. It will never die out if you care for it. It will only go st grow stronger each time it is shared. The messenger turned to head home. They couldn't get the picture of this poor person out of their mind. Their heart was heavy, but even in all the sorrow, they're burned in their heart, like the small shard of the ember, a remnant of hope. The beacon did matter. The embers from the beacon that the four messengers had carried with them would not die out. They would continue to grow. And each time they shared, new lives would be touched and new people would feel its warmth. It had always been that way. 
and it always would be. No matter what the rest of the world might seem to think, the beacon still matters. So if we are the beacon, we worry in our, in our world that perhaps maybe we don't matter. I can think of those who maybe come to our, to our food bank those who come looking for help, those who get enwrapped in our, in our shawls of hope, those we visit in hospital and home, and just the fact that we are there for those who know that if there comes a time that they need help, that Cole Harbor Woodside United Church is there. And the ways in which we give back to the community through Cole Harbor Cares and so many of the other things that we do remind, should remind us that our work is important and vital in our community. I want to leave you with one thing for each of you to think about. What is the beacon of hope that you as an individual carry? What is the ember from the beacon that you carry that you can fan into a flame of new hope and can, that we can share as a community with others? Think about that and Maybe when we get together again, we can have some time and think of new and exciting ways that we as Cold Harbor Woodside United Church can be God's presence, God's beacon in our world. Amen. I don't know if anyone has our 
moment permission this morning, do we? I didn't see the two sign on. No. Uh, <clears throat> it's a wonderful picture of the Margaretsville Lighthouse there. Uh, the church that I served in the Annapolis Valley, the Margaretsville congregation was just down the road from that, uh, from that lighthouse. Um, so just as by way of uh, mission, uh, moment for mission this morning, just a reminder um, that it is important for us as part of the United Church of Canada uh, to, uh, to remember and to tell the stories of our, of our mission service fund. Uh, it has been the way in which the United Church of Canada has reached out into the communities uh, where there is need. It is the ways in which we have supported outdoor ministries like our children's camps. It has been the ways in which we have brought light and hope uh, to those all around the world because we are able to share from the great abundance that we have in this, in this community and in this nation. Uh, it means also that there is great and important work for us to continue to do. And uh, although the, uh, the, uh, the offerings to our mission service fund nationally have, have declined um, over the years, uh, its work continues to be important. Uh, so in an ask from those who, uh, who are leading in the mission and service fund, I'll ask uh, on behalf of them, on behalf of all who receive help through our mission and service fund, uh, to please, if you already give to the United Church through the Mission and Service Fund, we ask you to please continue. Uh, if you're able to offer just a little bit more, that's wonderful. And if you haven't been giving to Mission and Service, I really do ask and encourage you to make that part of your regular giving uh, as part of our life and our ministry in the world. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, there wasn't a space in this uh, service for an announcement, so uh, the only one I would really ask to, uh, to uh, bring at this time before we bring in, move into our offering prayer is uh, from Joe Brogan, who's been uh, organizing our uh, sweet and succulent auction that's coming up in the next uh, week or so. And she has been so excited and so thrilled to have 27 uh, people offer uh, things for the auction. So she, that is more than what she had hoped for. And so that's wonderful. She's greatly appreciative. And so I just ask you to watch the announcements uh, in the coming week for that auction to open. If you're on Facebook, you can go onto the church's Facebook page and have a look at the things that are being offered. And that's the way you will bid. And for those of you who don't have Facebook, uh, there, there is opportunity for you still to bid on things and uh, that will come uh, through the church office over the coming days. So please do watch for that. I invite us to share in a time of offering prayer this morning. We don't always know how much money we have or how much we will need. In precarious economic times, we are tempted to hoard our money for ourselves. In this offering, we, show, we, we can show our faith and our hope that God will supply all of our needs. We walk by faith and hope. We live by faith and hope. We give by faith and hope. God of great gifts, you have given us so much. Accept these gifts from our hands. Our faithful response to your abundant grace. Amen. And I invite you to follow along uh, with the prayer of caring for our neighbors. In a pa it's a pastor, pandemic pastoral prayer. Let us pray. In these days of knowing, not knowing, we like the buds of the trees are eager to burst forth into the world. Hold us gently until we are certain in the ways of loving our neighbor. Let us not toss ourselves and neighbor into thoughtless harm. Let us recall that all life is sacred in your eyes, from newborn child to those with lines of life etched upon their faces and hands and faces, everyone in between including those whose immune systems are compromised. All are your beloved, whose care we are blessed to bear. And we seek blessing upon all who have answered a call to care for us in our times of physical healing, 
No matter our opinion, our ideology, our hardship, God. All these we hold in our care as neighbors. Help us to hear that caring for one another is your command on our lives. Open our ears to hear the tragedy in this time of coronavirus. And not only our own anxiety and grief that may come on blustering words and tired rhetoric. Instead, let us think on how we will make the world a better place. Instead, let us think on what kindness, however small, we might offer someone. Instead, let us remember that our life is not our own, but belongs to you. Instead, let us dream how we might enter our communities to be a beacon of hope for those living in disorder and to come alongside them while they find order, alongside them while they reorder their lives. Help us always, God, to remember our promise to you that we will care for our neighbors as ourselves, that your son Jesus taught us. Let us lift these prayers and all the prayers of our hearts into one as we pray together, as Jesus also taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from a time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Cheers. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Audrey, for keeping Charles on the straight and narrow and getting <laughs> to that last verse. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for joining us this morning, and it's uh, so good to be together, and it'll be good to be together again uh, in the days that are to come. But as we uh, leave this time of worship, go out and be that beacon of hope within your communities. Help those that need the strength of hope to carry on each day. Be the beacon of light that can be saving grace for each of us. Shine bright and share the stories of hope that can sustain not only us, but all those around us as we move into each day. And now, as we go, May the grace of our Lord Jesus, may the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you wherever you are and in the week ahead. Amen. <laughs>